Hello and welcome to the Cambridge Skeptics live stream. The Cambridge Skeptics are a volunteer organization. We are dedicated to promoting critical thinking, science, and positive skepticism in our local community of Cambridge, but also across the UK and beyond. And today we've got Andrew, Sam, and Ellen with us. And Andrew is going to tell us all about false memories. Or yes. is he? Oh, yeah. remember? I can't remember. We can't remember. These, this is what we've signed up for is jokes like this. Yes. The next the entire, time. The entire time. It's, it's, it's all going to be that. Right. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, and do some technology stuff. I was I was very impressed with the spreadsheet stuff last week. So uh, there will be no spreadsheet Thank this you. time. I'm I'm sorry for all the spreadsheet fans, but uh, we'll see what we can do. Okay, so let's share that. Can everybody see that? Looking great. Looking great. Okay, awesome. So uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about false memories and also about uh, something called the Mandela effect, uh, which we'll come on to a bit later. But to start with, I'm going to get you guys to do a, a little bit of a test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some faces and you guys are going to have to try and remember the faces. And I'm going to test and see how good your memory is. OK, so I'm going to um, people in the chat, if there are any people in the chat, feel free to play along as well. Um, I would very much like to see what you think as well. So uh, here we go. These are the faces. This is the first one. Oh. Hang on, it's not moving on. Why are we not moving on? Oh, there you go. There's the first face. There's the second one. There's the third one. And there's a distraction. So, um, yes. in terms like this, there, we're, you'll have a, a sort of a study stage where they introduce the faces and stuff like that. Then there's always like a distraction task. So you're not just sitting there trying to remember every detail of those faces um, before the next bit. Now, so the next bit of the... Uh, this is where you're going to need the little A's and B's that I ask you guys to prepare so I can see how you're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two faces. All you need to do is hold up the letter that matches the face you have already seen before. Okay, so here we go. Here are the first two faces. So hold up A if you've seen A before and B if you've seen B before. Mm. <laughs> if this is not true. Erica's not. Erica's got A, but but the other two, um, Ellen and Sam, have got B. B is the right answer. Um, <laughs> um, we'll we'll do the next one. See if you do any better on the next one, Erica. So the next one is this one. So if you've seen A before, hold up A. If you've seen B before, hold up B. Oh, A is across the board. Yes, well done. That mullet is mullet. really distinctive. Mullet. Yeah. Yeah, mullet man. So and then more distractions. So another distraction task coming before we get to the proper test phase of the experiment. So this is the, when they do this experiment, this is the phase they're actually interested in. This is where they record the, the results. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you some more faces. And uh, again, ask you to just tell me which one you've seen before. But this time it's gonna be a little bit harder. Um, the faces in this case are very similar. Um, all the faces in this experiment have been computer generated. They're not photos of real people. So it's possible to manipulate them to make them look very similar. Mm -hmm. um, so bear that in mind. So here's the first set of faces. So again, tell me, hold up A if you think A is the one you've seen before and B if you think B is the one you've seen before. So here we go. So we have A's across the board. So an A from Sam, Ellen and Erica. Okay, so here are the next set of faces. You've seen A before. B. B's across the board. Marvellous. Okay. And here's the third set of faces. Okay, so we have two A's and a B. So this one's a little bit more uh, confusing. Um, so, Erica, why, why, why did you say B? Because, well, so first of all, I've just been distracted by the mullet. <laughs> and I was like, I only expected to remember mullet related information about this guy. Um, okay. But like the reason why I said B is just, I don't know, I can't explain it. it. Just, it feels more like a real face in some way, which is weird. Like that's like what I feel in my head is like, that face doesn't look fake. The other one looks fake 
for some reason, okay. that's like the only gut feeling that I have. Okay, what about the other, you two, Sam and Ellen, why did you choose A? I feel like I've recognized the under, under eye darkness. I've, okay. the, mm. a, the picture A has more of that. Um, okay. Yeah. Right. Well, I think oh, I did it on. Oh, oh. Go ahead, Sam. I was going to say, I think I did it on gut instinct, but also part of me just kind of went, well, actually, the face is less smooth. Maybe that means it's not been altered. As okay. Much. Well, so, but if they're both computer generated, then yes. So the reason why you guys had difficulty with this one is because I played a trick on it. Yes. I effectively generated a false memory. So if we go on to here, I'll show you what I did. So with the first three faces in the study phase down the left hand side, you can see the faces I presented you. In the quiz stage for the second one, I showed you a different version of oh. that first phase. So when you were asked to choose between the two faces at the end, you'd already seen both of those faces. So some for, for um, Erica. Yeah, I picked up on the false memory. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, no, sorry. Um, no, that's the wrong way around. Erica, you got it right. Ellen and Sam. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ellen I and Sam the replaced one. the face in their memory with the false one. Oh. So um, this is this is basically what we're going to be talking about this evening, is false memories and how easy it is to um, introduce this sort of thing. So in order to... Oh, sort my, of my mind is already blown. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. That, yeah. In order to look at this sort of thing, we're going to start by talk, talking about memory in general and how it works. Um, and there's a great um, sort of sentence uh, uh, quote from uh, Steve Novella of uh, uh, um, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, who I'm sure a lot of people uh, watching will be aware of. And uh, his quote is this. It says, when someone looks at me and earnestly says, I know what I saw, I'm fond of replying, no, you don't. You have a distorted and constructive memory of a distorted and constructive perception both of which are subservient to whatever narrative your brain is operating under. So we're going to take that quote as the sort of basis for the first part of the, the, the talk this morning and look at those different things in turn. So first up, we have perception. Now, when we think about uh, perception, uh, we, you know, it's what we experience around, what we see and what we hear. And we, we generally get this feeling that we're taking most of it in. We, you know, what we, we see is what's going on, we hear things, but there's a lot of uh, good evidence from psychology to show that that's not actually the case. There are lots of gaps in our perception. So I'm gonna start with a, um, a study by Simons and Levin from 1998. And this is a study on something called change blindness. Now change blindness, as the, uh, the name suggests, is the fact that we are actually quite bad at noticing changes when they take place. So in this study, what they did, they had someone go up to members of the public and with a map and go, you know, start asking for directions. During the middle of the conversation, two other people carrying a board would walk along between the, the two people. And the person asked with the map would swap out for one of the people carrying the board and then continue on as though nothing had happened. Um, what they found is less than 50% of the people in the, in the public noticed that they were no longer talking to the same person as they had before. Now, I'm I wanted to give you guys an example of change blindness. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a picture. It's actually two pictures, and it will swap between the two versions of the pictures. And there's something that changes in those pictures. Now, I don't want you to say what it is, but as soon as you say it, um, well, stick up a hand or something like that so I can see you've seen it and we'll see, see who, who gets there first. So here we go. Did everyone see the cat walk across? Here we go. Here's the picture. So Sam's got it. Queen. Oh, it's just you, Ellen. Go on. No, I'm not seeing it. Okay. So look at near her head. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So in this picture, for people who haven't seen it yet who are watching, um, <laughs> literally a large portion of the background scenery 
disappears and reappears. So there's a sort of mountainous area near the lady's head that just disappears and reappears. Now, this and once you see it, it's so obvious. <laughs> this is an example of like change blindness where, you know, we don't, literally there's a massive change going on, but we don't take it in. Another famous example is inattentional uh, blindness. Now, I think you guys are all aware of this. Um, I'm hoping the people uh, watching might not be, so we'll go through this. This is another experiment um, by Simon Chabis in 1999. Um, and basically looks at um, the concept of how we don't really take things in unless we're paying attention. So what you have to do in this experiment is I'm gonna show you a video of two groups of people playing basketball. And what you have to do is count the number of times the white team passed the basketball. And I wanna see how good you are at paying attention to that. So here it goes. If you're in the chat, please add your your count as well. <laughs> okay, so how many times do they count the basketball? Count past the basketball. <laughs> oh, like 12. Uh, 13. Ellen? Oh, I lost count. <laughs> you lost count. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, the, anybody, if you like I said, post your, your answer in the uh, chat if you're watching. Um, the actual answer was 15. Oh. But did you guys all notice the other thing that took place in this video? He, yes. Yeah, the big old gorilla. Yes. I, so put, but I didn't. I remember the first time I saw this video because I've seen it before. I did not notice it the first time. Yeah. Same, so yeah. I'll play it, yeah. play it again for, it. for anybody who's watching this who didn't notice it. So this time, rather than actually paying attention to the basketball people, just keep your attention in the middle of the screen. And this is definitely the same video. Um, so there are people passing the ball back and forth, moving around. Um, and then... It's I was worried so it wasn't going to turn up there When you think of, like, when you watch it the second time. Yeah. Gorilla comes in, beats his chest, and then slowly walks off to the side. Now, as Erica said, it, it's it. I remember seeing this for the first time and not seeing the gorilla. Um, and it, you kind of have that doubt. Of, Am I seeing the same video? Is that the same thing? And it, it definitely is. And this is, like I said, this is an example of inattentional blindness because you were focusing your attention on something else. You simply didn't take it. Um, other things going on in the scene. Um, so, yeah, so, so far we have change blindness where we don't really take in when things change, even if they're big things. Um, if we're not paying attention to things, we don't, don't see them. And so the next one is um, something called choice blindness. I'm afraid I don't have an experiment to actually do with you for this one. Um, so choice blindness is um, basically where when we make choices, we don't always, we tend to justify those choices when someone presents them back to us, even if, even if they're presenting mm -hmm. something incorrect. So in this, in this experiment, what they would do is they would show people two photos and ask them to say which one they found the most attractive. Uh, once they'd indicated them, as you can see in this one, it indicates the lady with the long uh, dark hair, the person presenting them would do a little bit of sleight of hand and would pass them the other photo. They would then mm. ask them to tell them why they chose that yeah. photo. And really cool. people would. People would justify why they made the choice that wasn't the choice they made. They just assumed they made that was the choice they'd made. And so they went on to justify it. So, um, yeah, so th those are the, 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 the three main things I want to talk about uh, perception. I'm going to stop sharing for a bit, uh, see what you guys have uh, anything to say about that, anything, any comments. I think it's a part, certainly the last part kind of goes to your, um, to a certain extent, back to your, your, your quote from Steve Novella, in that we, 
when we've decided that we've made a choice, we rationalize it to ourselves. Like we, yes. we have this sense of self that is incredibly consistent and to a certain extent rational or at least reasonable. Um, and, and, and so we have this, this, yeah, this internal need to, um, to make decisions in line with our, our values and our sort of processes. And, and, and so when, when you're then presented with information that feels odd, you kind of come up with a reason why um and that that yeah that makes sense and it also is sort of is why some people kind of have um will will come up with reasons for doing things after the fact when mm. actually they were mm. quite irrational or random. and like was, this is how magic works like where i like i i love watching magicians and i am always astounded and, and this, like, that guy gets it's the same things that they're exploiting, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same, it's the same sort of thing. The fact that um, magicians are, are very good at exploiting the fact that we don't pay attention to things. It's very easy to say, you know, look over here. Oh, look, I've now got the watch, whatever. You know, mm. um, it's... So, yeah, so the, 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 the first thing that we're looking at is the perception. Because obviously, before we can remember things, we have to perceive them. So straight off the bat, we know that our perception is not that good. We're, we don't take in everything. We're easily tricked. We're easily confused by things. And sometimes we don't even see that a mountain has disappeared. You know, we're... Go ahead, oh, yeah, but I was going to say, but also, we, to a certain extent, we do it to ourselves. Yeah. Um, like, I, I think we've all, we've all, I don't know, had that experience where, like, we're, I don't know, flatten our backs and someone goes oh that cloud looks like a dog and you kind of go which cloud oh that cloud and then you see it and you're like you know what it does look like a dog and then all you can see is that that cloud looks like a dog <laughs> um and and so very much what we yeah what we perceive really isn't just the unfiltered truth it is our own capacity to yes. like our, our, there is it's not just brain senses there's a lot of stuff happening in between before yeah. the kind of the conscious part of our brain. I, I've got uh, a question. I mean, sorry. Andrew, yeah. I've got a question about whether, um, going back to that, that last one you did with the two cases, the two women, um, do, do we know like how much doubt plays into that and like whether people, mm. um, you know, participants um, like think Think, you know before they try and justify their their choice do they do they doubt whether they actually chose that and also do we know whether they might just be doing that just to be polite to avoid having to say actually Pos possibly i mean the, are there the, other studies that test that theory um i don't know i i'm uh they're they're the, I know that the people who did that study have done several follow-up studies on it. I haven't, I haven't actually read those ones yet. Um, I know that there probably was doubt in it because some of the responses they got um, to it were things like, why did you choose the picture? And they went, I have no idea. And, you know, um, and, and people would like, there was a, they recorded lots of people sort of nervously laughing and stuff like that, you know, yeah. being, um, yeah, I don't know why I picked that now that you're asking me. It's, you know, um, so yes, I suspect that people's doubt and that lot came into it. I, I just want to touch on something quickly that, that Sam said um, about the, you know, the, the, the pictures in the clouds and stuff. Now, you guys are aware of uh, pareidolia, which is where you see usually faces in things that aren't faces. Um, interestingly enough with that, we know from experimentation that the part of your brain that is responsible for identifying things as faces actually fires before the part of your brain that rationalizes it as not being a face. So when you oh. see a picture of something where you're like, oh yeah, that, you know, that building's windows makes it look like a face, your brain sees it as a face before it tells you it's a building. So you, as you said, Sam, you're completely right. Your brain doesn't actually process reality in the way it is it doesn't say building that looks like a face it says face oh actually a building um so with that in mind we've, we've done perception let's let's move on to memory i'm gonna attempt to share my screen again um 
Now, where did I leave it? Here we go. Can you all see that? Is that sharing? Yep. Yep. Okay, good. Right. So, um, what we're going to look at is uh, why is that not changing again? Come on. There we go. This is my sort of representation of one of the more common models of memory. This is the Atkinson and mm. Schifrin uh, 1968 model. This, now I, I will say that I'm not convinced this is the best model of memory. Uh, the reason I like to use this one is it, it's one that a lot of people are familiar with. It has things like the short term and long term memory. And then these are mm. you know, things that people are generally familiar with. So the reason I'm uh, representing it with SIBs is because that's effectively what these things are. Um, so at the top, you have what's called sensory memory. And in this case, I've sort of divided it into iconic memory, which is your visual memory, um, and echoic memory, which is your uh, hearing memory. Um, so basically, when you, when you see or hear something, it goes through this, your, this sensory memory um, filter, where with Iconic memory it sort of stays in there between like half a second and a second. And then if it doesn't pass on to the next level, it's gone. That, that information is that you, you forget that. With echoic mm. memory, it's slightly longer, we get 1.5 to 5 seconds. But can again, I ask a question does... about that? Sorry? About, can I ask a question about that? About yeah, the ahead. difference between um, visual and auditory memory? About like, could it be that the differences between them? that because with visual memory you have so much to take in that you have to be really selective about what you remember but with auditory memory it's um kind of different there's it's quite it's not very often that you have loads of different um sounds yeah sounds like di different sources of sounds is that right? It, that, there may be, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, obviously, we yeah. are, as a species, very reliant on our vision. It is our dominant sense. The other senses are, are very much less so, you know, our sense of smell is rubbish. Our hearing is nothing compared with animals, but our, we, our vision is, is fairly good for a mammal. So, um, yeah, I think that, that that probably is the case. There's more input coming in, and that's why the, you know, the buffer on it is a little bit uh, lower before it passes on. Being. But anyway, so when you when our sensors come in, uh, they get filtered through these various stages of memory, and only uh, uh, some of them then get passed on to the second stage, and that's what we we normally refer to as short term memory. The short term memory is um, the sort of memory you use when someone tells you a telephone number on the phone, you know, and you say, "Can you just pass this telephone number on someone?" And you like remember it for 20 to 30 seconds, you tell the other person and then it's gone. You know, someone asks you later what that number was. You don't, if you didn't write that down, that's that's gone. And so, again, a lot of our memories last for this short period of time and then they're gone. However, some memories make make it through that and they enter what we call long term. memory. Now, as far as people are aware, the duration in which memories stay in long-term memory is indefinite. They're in there, they, they pretty much stay there to an extent. We'll come on to that in a sec. Um, but obviously, you've gone through quite a lot of filtering processes. First of all, your perceptions haven't taken anything in. Then you filtered your memory through your sensory memory and your short-term memory before it even gets to the point where long-term memories occur. Now, long-term memories can be enforced by things like um, learning, you know, rep repetition and stuff like that. But generally, a fraction of your memories actually make it that far. Um, so, any any comments on that before I move move on? No, I was going to say that like this this makes sense given my like personal experience. Like for example, when you mentioned the telephone number thing, I. I, I think so my mom like was, was an educational psychologist and she used to do like psychological tests on me. So apparently I have like a below average short term memory. Um, and if I have to have a telephone number to remember, I have to repeat it to myself, like Dory from Finding Nemo so that I don't forget. Um, but on the other hand, and maybe because of that, like my long term memory is really good. Like, so I have all of my debit and credit card numbers memorized. I have my passport number memorized. Like I find it's not really easy to remember things. 
Like, <laughs> I was, that, that and also all of the online shopping. Yeah, both hit him in, like, you know, lockdown, right? I, I, <laughs> I was cool. going to ask, like, something related about, like, how, what are there, like, requirements for um, how you get um, information to go into long-term memory? Like, do you have to use it a lot? Do you have to go over it in your head a lot? I, I just put it there. <laughs> it's, I just I decided to remember or something. But Erica also does have the capacity to just reel off reams of dates on various things. Like it is, it's once it goes into the long term memory, it stays there. Yeah. Yeah. Especially so, if it's numbers. So I think I think in answer to Anne's question there, there is um uh aspects of things that you go over things that you're paying extra attention to so obviously as we've already discussed things if you're not paying attention to something you tend to miss it but if you're focused on something if it's if it's something you're trying to remember if you're trying um or if you're going over the same piece of information over and over again which i suspect is where erica's memory for dates comes from because you studied like archaeology now like you probably did lots of history and went over those dates again and again um so yeah, but th things that go into your memory more than once are, are definitely more likely to be stored into uh, long-term memory than um, things that things that don't. So, can I ask uh, a question? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Andrew, can I yeah. ask a question about hypnosis? Oh goodness! So, like, um, you know, I've seen on TV um, people getting hypnosis and then bringing back memories from their childhood and Think things that they thought they had forgotten, things that they had no idea happened. Is that is there any truth to that? So that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to ask you to try to remember that for the next little bit. We're going to be talking about memory recall in a, in yeah, a second. Okay. Um, and it does very much come into play, um, the, the topic of hypnosis and things like that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of go through the, the process of a memory because there's other aspects to it which I think people don't generally uh, realize. So I'm going to give you here's a here's a, a hypothetical memory. So let's say that you have gone out with your four friends, Susan, Bob, Helen, and Dave, and you've had gone out to a coffee shop and you've you know had some cakes and coffee. I'm not exactly sure what they're eating. It looks like corn on the cob, but I think it's probably a cake. Um, and you know, and you're you're remembering. So the first question is. How do you remember? How does that information store in your brain? So what, what, what's your sort of gut instinct of how, how the information is, is stored? Or maybe, maybe I should word that a bit, but where is the information stored in your brain? Do you, are you thinking like there's a memory? There's a memory somewhere? vault. There's a yeah. place yeah. and like, if you drill to the right place in the brain, you'll lose that memory, right? Yes. Okay. Cool. You that's, have that's memories general... related. Sorry, Ella. What was that? I, I, if if I were like um, trying to remember this, um, you'd have memories related to Susan and some related to Bob and some related to he Helen and some related to Dave and like they might be stored in different parts of the brain. Yes. Oh. So Ellen hit on hit on it at the end there the, about the stored in different parts of the brain, but it's more. Um, more so than, than she's saying. So basically the first thing that happens when you try to remember something is your brain breaks it up into pieces. So your brain effectively stores aspects of that memory in the parts of your brain responsible for processing those aspects. So the visual parts of the memory are stored in the visual cortex. The parts of the memory say, so, yeah, about the physical actions you performed might be in the motor cortex, you know, various parts of your brain store those memories there it's all distributed up and broken up like like a puzzle so that comes on to the question of what happens when we try to re recall that memory so first of all there's there's various different types of um memory re um, memory retrieval so there is recall which is basically um accessing memories uh where without really being cued is what that is so Think of, say, like a fill in the blank test. You know, um, you, you have to fill in the blank word in the sentence and you, you just sort of, oh, yeah, that's it. Um, there's 
the kind of memory we generally think of, which is recollection. And this is where your memory, uh, your brain effectively reconstructs the memory. It fills, it takes the bits of information, like Ellen said, the memory of Susan, the memory of Helen, and puts them together in something that makes sense of the, the event. Um, there's recognition. The recognition is where, um, say a multiple choice exam, where you've got three choices and your brain goes, oh, that's the one I've seen before. Um, so there's that type of memory. And then there's sort of the relearning type of memory, which is where you see the information again and you, you, know, you just enforce that memory and open it again. So let's say that it's a few weeks later and we're trying to uh, recall this event. Now, what we might find is that straight off, there might be some, some gaps in our memory. As we, we already talked about with the perception and things like that, there are not all the information makes it through. So what, what, what sort of happens here? Well, the question is, how does our brain fill in those gaps? Now, um, the analogy I like to give for memory is, is a lot. Well, first of all, a lot of people think that memory acts like a video camera. Um, so there was a poll done in 2011, which found that like 63% of people have this belief that memory acts like a, a video camera. And 48 people think, 48% of people think that once a memory's in there, that is it, it's solid. You know, it, it doesn't change. But that's not the case. So, you know, like I said, the analogy I like is that of a filing cabinet. So when, you, when your memory goes in, you put that file in the filing cabinet. When you want to recall that memory, most people would think, oh, I go to the filing cabinet and take it out. But that's not what happens. What happens is someone else goes to the filing cabinet, pulls it out, gives you a summation of what it says, and you just try to fill in the blanks the best you can. What then happens is that original version is screwed up and thrown away. You write down your notes and you refile your notes back in the filing cabinet so that's what's there for the next time you want to recall it so there's been a number of sort of tests on this uh let me stop sharing while we discuss this where's my mouse there we are um there's been a number of sort of tests on this uh to so uh study in uh, 2012 looked at this and they found that each time you recall an event you distort it so effectively um every time you you remember something you change it a bit it gets uh uh affected in a way that makes as i said with the filing cabinet later recall is always going to be different and over time your memories can change to the point of being unrecognizable um we also find that memory edits your brain edits your memories to stay in line with your current thoughts and things like that. this is uh, part of what Stephen novella said about um how it performs to a certain narrative so a good way to think about this is um, how you think about someone who's a good friend of yours now. And let's say when you met them, you didn't get off, but you're really good friends with them now. Well, when you look back, you might not remember the things that made you not like them to start with. You might assume you liked them from the outset because your memory has been tainted with um, how you record it in the first place. We also like our memories to be logical and consistent. You know, if there's something uh, that, that seems to fit to, to us, we will more likely fill that in, in our memory than the thing that might not have fit at the time. And, you know, that the we was actually the case. If I just um, go back to sharing my screen so we can fill in this memory. So, for example, we've got this memory with our blanks in it. So let's say, you know, um, we're trying to remember who was at the, the coffee shop. And, but, and we know that Dave never goes anywhere without his girlfriend. You know, it, it's really rare for us to go out and see Dave without his girlfriend. So we might fill in that memory of Dave's girlfriend. In there. And likewise, we, always, we know that Susan always has a hot chocolate. So we might change the memory, if I can get it to work again, might change the memory so that Dave's girlfriend's there and Susan had a hot chocolate. So what other aspects can uh, affect memory? You know, this is, this is so far sort of ways that, you know, feel very internal about how our memories can be changed. 
But what, what can produce these kind of um, effects? Now, there's a few interesting little experiments that have been done. Um, viewing somebody else doing something can give you the memory of having performed that action before uh, yourself. So they, 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 they did various uh, tests on this where they would either have someone do an action or watch someone else do an action. And then a certain period later, they'd ask them about it. And they found a high, uh, a high number of people would report having done the action when all they did was see. Um, yes, that makes sense. It's, it's a bit like, like the same thing is also like how you learn new tasks, right? Just like if I watch someone do it, I it's like my brain tries to mimic Yes. What I'm seeing. So it kind of makes sense that you would. Yeah, your, like, your brain is wired in that way. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a beneficial fact that you would go, okay, I know how to do that by watching. Yeah, that. yeah. Huh. So related to that, they also found that if you just imagine doing a task, you can remember having performed it. So again, they would um, get people to either do a task or imagine doing a task. And again, they would find people would report that uh, they performed the task themselves. Um, as we, um, I think Erica brought this up, um, they, they found that the more similar the sort of false memory is to an actual memory, the more likely you are to conflate mm. the two and maybe replace them. Um, so I'll give you an example of my, my personal experience. When I used to work for the NHS, um, um, working in support, one of the things we used to do was facilities calls. So people would call up and say, I've got this, this problem. And um, someone phoned up one day and they were, they were said, oh yeah, um, there's black smoke coming out from under one of our doors. Could, could you send someone over from facilities to have a look at it? And so I was like, well, if there's black smoke, you should really sound the fire alarm and get out. And they're like, no, 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 you just send someone over. And after trying to convince them to, to, to do this for worrying them a long amount of time, I asked them why they couldn't sound the fire alarm. And their response was, well, we've just moved into the building. We haven't decided whose responsibility it is yet. So I, of course, shared this story around the office and told people. And a while later, I came into the office one day to hear one of my colleagues relaying this story as if it happened to them. They'd heard me tell the story a number of times. They remembered it, but they just put themselves into that story. And um, Sam, do you want to go? Yeah. Oh, no, I was going to say there is, there's, this is very similar to a um, fabulous podcast episode on um, revisionist history by Malcolm Gladwell called um, Free Brian Williams, where a, a very, very similar thing happened, whereby he was, he was a, a, an anchor for CNN and was... Um, I think it was been, ABC, actually. There we go, false memories. <laughs> NBC, yeah. well, um, no, that's just... That's not even a false memory. That's just a mistake. Um, <laughs> but in any case, he he had been in uh, he'd been in a helicopter, um, and in Iraq covering the um, uh, some of the, the action there in the early two thousands. And oh, yes, when he came back, he was he was talking about his experiences. And as he over the course of about a decade, I think it was, um, his story changed from oh I was in a helicopter and one of the other helicopters in our like troop got shot down like a mile away to oh no the helicopter i was in got shot down or maybe mm. it was shot at and like the one next like immediately next to us got shot down and and, and basically yeah he just he just sort of conflated the two but then was absolutely um uh yeah he, i remember him by the, lots of trouble for it yeah, yeah exactly oh yeah he, he, he basically got sort of shown out of the business but it's exactly it, the same thing where he'd... he'd is it something to do with when you know so many details about a story um, and, you, you know, it, the because of the situation, it, it could have been just as likely to be you rather than someone else. So you just... And it's, you know, so long ago that you're like... It, it, that you think that it's more likely mm. to be you. Like with mm. your colleague Andrew, you know, he worked in IT support as well, so and he's he knows the story so well that he thought that it was more likely to have been him. Yeah, kind of I think, unconsciously. Yeah, I think that's that's and, that's quite likely. And then of course, like I'm like, well, I I've not made any mistakes like that in my life. 
Like it's it's happened to other people, but not me. But now I'm like, well, maybe there is a memory that I have that actually didn't happen to me. Oh, I know a memory I have that didn't happen to me. What's that? Which was um, basically the getting the news of the Twin Towers being hit and falling um, while I was at school. Thing is, they fell after school was over. So I know that it can't be true. But at the same time, I can distinctly remember the teacher telling oh. us that they'd been hit by planes and they'd collapsed. Yep. And on that, I, so on that marvellous segue there, Sam, we're going to talk about flashbulb memories. So yes. um, flashbulb memories well done, are, are memories of profound life-changing events. And obviously um, the Twin Towers falling was one such event where people... You know, everyone knows where they were when that happened, except Sam, obviously. Um, so psychologists, being psychologists, uh, study this sort of thing. And so they looked at um, the, the, the uh, tax on the Twin Towers. And what they did is they talked to people um, and asked them, you know, very, very soon after the event happened, um, where were you when you heard this news? You know, what were you doing? That sort of thing. And got them to relay in an narrative. And um, then Can they I went just, back. I want to have an aside here. Like, imagine that this is your area of expertise, the thing that you study. And like, you see the plane sit and you're like, right, go, research yeah. project. The now. psychologists are messed like, up people. Amazing. But, um, and so um, they then tested them again. Uh, one week, six weeks, and 32 weeks wow. later. And they found that their memories profoundly changed over that time. Now, um, I couldn't find any actual examples of the, the, the sort of differences, but I did manage to find a similar study that took place in 1986 with the uh, Challenger shuttle disaster. Mm -hmm. When the, they, again, the 24 hours after that, they asked people to sort of um, say where they were and what they were doing. And then two and a half years after that, they went back and asked them. And I've got it written down somewhere here you go and so i'll give you an example of one of the descriptions so the first description was uh i was in my religious class and some people walked in and were started talking about it i didn't know the details except that it had exploded and the school teachers students had all been watching which i thought was so sad then after class i went to my room and watched the tv program talking about it and got all the details from that so that's the the, the response they gave 24 hours later two and a half years later they said when I first heard about the explosion, I was sitting in my freshman dorm room with my roommates and we were watching TV. It came on a news flash and we were both totally shocked. I was really upset and went upstairs to talk to my friend of mine and then called my parents. So it went from you know being in a classroom and, and you know, and people came in talking about it to actually watching it on the television. They changed the memory in their head. And um so this is, yeah, this is an example of uh, showing that even these really strong, powerful memories that uh, people think stay with you, I'm never going to forget, can change over time. The problem is that when it comes to memory, it gets worse than that. Not only is it a case of we mess up our own memories, but other people mess them up as well. So let's just jump back to our hypothetical memory, for example. So we've already messed it up a fair bit we've already introduced the elements that weren't there into this memory so let's say that um bob here in the uh, in in the middle between the two ladies um you know we remember bob being there but we what we're, we're talking to helen and susan one day and they said no 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 you're getting you know bob wasn't there it was it was tom so we will edit that memory because often we are very much reliant on other people. We're, we're, you know, we don't trust our own memories, but we tend to trust other people's memories of events. And so we might edit the memory to um, introduce Tom into the memory. And again, we recode that memory into our brain. We throw out what we had before. And this is now our memories. When we recall the event, this is what we recall. Um, so there's a number of, again, experiments that have been done by this that show how easy it is to um, alter, produce these kind of false memories. So uh, Elizabeth Loftus, who's one of the, the main researchers in this area that you'll come across if you uh, look into it, 
did an experiment where they showed people a, um, a video of two cars crashing into each other at a junction. And then they asked them some very simple questions. And the questions um, were, were identical apart from one word. So to one group of people, they would ask, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? And another group, they would ask how fast the cars going were they smashed into each other? And so they found that the people where they used the word hit would report an average of like 34 miles an hour. Whereas people where they used the word smashed would report 41 miles an hour. Now, uh, they, they used various other words. There were, you know, these, these are the two, two I picked out. But in some of the words, they, when they, they would like, like um, you know, uh, came together, things like that, bashed into each other. And they found that you often have a difference that could vary by a good 10 miles an hour. Now, think about that in terms of, um, legal situation. Yeah. If a car's going 30 miles an hour in a 30 speed limit and people report that, that's very different if they're going 40 miles an hour in a 30 speed limit and they have an accident. That can that have a, a effects. They also found that um, if they ask people, um, so they, they would say to people, you know, do you recall seeing broken glass around, around the crash site? Now there was none. Um, mm -hmm. But they found that 14% of people who use, who were given the word hit in the sentence reported broken glass. But 32% of people who had the word smashed would report broken glass. So you have these examples of how just the choice of words can affect how you remember things. Um, I, 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 and so other examples in this, they, they would do similar sort of studies where they would produce false memories where they would um, tell people various stories of things that they'd say, oh, your parents told us this story of things that happened in your childhood. And they would say, so things like, um, there was an, uh, uh, you caused an accident at a wedding, or you were attacked by an angry animal when you were a child, or you almost drowned and had to be rescued by lifeguards. And they would then come back later uh, and ask people about these memories. And people would fill in the details of these entirely constructed memories. And, oh, yes, I remember, you know, the lifeguard had really dark hair and you know, things like that. And the dog was an Alsatian. Um, they even did it with people um, convincing people that they witnessed an exorcism when they were younger. And people would, again, fill in the details of these things. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there for a second in case you have any questions or anything you want to say. Just no. Oh, wow. No, so, but, but just on, on flashball moments of 9-11, uh, this is another, there's another Malcolm Gladwell podcast or maybe it's a book or something that he covers. It's Sam's in. favourite podcast. It is Sam's favourite podcast. Uh, revisionist history. <laughs> New season out a couple of weeks ago. Um, We're not going to endorse it. We just really like it. I, I think actually it's, I think it, I think we are, were asked for like a list of endorsements in one of the early live streams and I put it down as something that people should go and see because so often there is so much more to events than um, than actually you know what first appears in revisions history is a good deep dive into it but they he, he goes and talks to his old uh, his old uh, neighbor who was his downstairs neighbor at the time of 9-11 and he has you know he has a I think he has a diary that he's he, but he was living in New York like he yeah he was living in New York and he kept a diary so he has a same day account and then he goes and talks to his neighbor and his neighbor's completely off what he wrote um and and particularly talks about how they'd had a conversation and that Malcolm Gladwell had said that actually he needed to fly out for work the following day and actually now was the safest time to fly except of course actually all of the security restrictions put in days later and when you go back and look at his calendar there's no reason for him to fly and actually it wasn't until two weeks later that he flew and so she's the neighbor has kind of compressed lots of stuff that happened around the event into the event that's um, actually quite interesting because um though I'm not, i haven't done like much reading up on it there is an aspect of how we remember time and we tend to yeah. compress and conflate things yeah and so things so, with lots of detail appear to happen over lots of period, a long period of yeah. time whereas things with very little detail seem to happen very quickly so you know if you spend six hours doing nothing it you remember it as a very short span of time whereas if you spend six hours doing a lot of stuff 
you remember it as a really long period of time. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that is exactly right. Yeah. So you don't remember one other thing remember I want to talk about about memory before we move on to the sort of fun stuff with the Mandela effect um, is sort of memories formed under stress and memories when you're actually expected to remember. So uh, there was an interesting experiment carried out in America in 2013, uh, where they took 800 military personnel who are undergoing uh, a very stressful sort of mock prisoner of war experiment. Uh, not experiment, it was, it was training, but the psychologists came along and went, we're, we're doing that. Um, so what they, they did in this experiment uh, is that they would, they would do the whole hog. They'd have people go out on, on patrol. They'd then turn up and, uh, and take them at gunpoint, put them, bundle them into a helicopter, fly them off somewhere. And they would then interrogate, effectively, for a period of time, ask them lots of questions before they were rescued and taken away for be, being debriefed. Now, the people who were undergoing this were told that this, you know, they were gonna go through this experience and told they would have to be remember what happened to them. And so, um, you know, they were, you know, you will be debriefed afterwards and you've got to show how well you can help us identify the terrorists or whoever who kidnapped you. And so what the psychologists did is they would, um, ask them either leading questions or more open questions. So for example, they would say something like, did the interrogator wear glasses? And if so, what type? Or they might say, did your interrogator remove his glasses before interrogating you? Please describe the glasses he was wearing. So obviously you can see mm -hmm. that straight off, if someone says to you, you know, describe the glasses you're wearing, you assume they're wearing glasses. And so they do various things like this. They do things like telephones. You know, was there a telephone in the interrogation room? Or did the interrogator allow you to use the telephones? Huh. So, and they found that if people were presented with... So first of all, the interrogator wasn't wearing glasses. And they found that if you were presented with no misinformation in, in the statement, only like 2.5% of people would recall wearing glasses. However, if you were told in the question that they were wearing glasses, it went up to 20% of people would report wearing glasses. Um, the telephone one is much more interesting because with this, it was like only 10% of people recalled there being a telephone. Again, there wasn't, no telephone. Um, if they were say, just ask the general open question about there being a telephone, 98% of the people who got the other question saying, were you allowed to use the telephone, recalled there being a telephone. So another thing they did with this experiment is probably the more important thing is um, identifying your interrogator. So what they, they did is um, they would have two groups. They would have one group where the during the interrogation, I'm sorry, uh, they were during the debriefing, they were shown a photograph and said, you know, uh, just ask general questions. You know, did you see this person? Blah, 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 blah. Um, another group, they, they didn't. And then they would go back and ask them to identify from a lineup the, the, the person. And they found that um, with the people who were given that, that photograph, 84% misidentified their interrogator. Now, I want to show you this picture uh, because I think this really sort of shows um, what we're talking about here. This guy on the left was the interrogator. The guy on the right was the person they identified because they Those saw his Those are very picture. different people. Those are very different people. Wow. So, um, yeah, so... I do want to quickly touch on, because I, I said I would talk about the, the, the thing that Ellen brought up with the hypnosis. Um, so obviously we can see from these various things that it's very easy with leading questions and stuff uh, for people to, um, you know, cause your memories to be corrupted. Um, there was a program, it wasn't really hypnosis, well, it was hypnosis, they did hypnosis for past life regression. Um, and there was a Tony Robinson um, program where he looked at past life regression. And in the uh, program, they said, you know, they were like, 
oh, you're going back, you know, you're going back through each now your birth, and now you're beyond your birth, and you're in your previous life. Well, straight away, they're telling him he had a previous life, so that's sort of uh, making the expectations. And they ask him to recall details. Now, bearing in mind that Tony Robinson also does time team, and he basically does archaeology <laughs> in some way for a career, it was quite easy for him to recall lots of details from a period in history where he could have been alive. And also you have the police officers have to be very careful with this. You know, if you ask leading questions, people will, um, you know, give the wrong answers. One of the things we often see on TV shows is where they'll go, you know, like with the photo, did you see this suspect? Was this the person? Whereas what they actually tend to do nowadays is they'll present people with a list, uh, a, a, a collection of photos and they'll often show them ones where there isn't the actual suspect in them mm. just to see if they're identifying someone because they're expected to identify someone or whether they're actually identifying the person who's who's there um i'm, I'm just actually going to read you um something which always puts a little bit of a downer on the situation so based on obviously what we've we've talked about how easy it is to um construct memories and how people can distort memories by getting you to do various things imagine things and stuff like that there's a couple of um self-help books on the market which um look at dealing with uh recovering from sexual trauma and sort of rape and stuff like that and i'm going to read you the, the quotes because i always find them genuinely disturbing based on sort of what we know about memory so here's a piece of advice in one of the the books it says, spend some time imagining that you were sexually abused without worrying about the accuracy of, or proving anything or having any ideas that make sense. Ask yourself these questions. What time of day is it? Where are you? Indoors or outdoors? What kind of things are happening? Is there one person with you? Would it, who would likely be the perpetrator? When were you most vulnerable to sexual abuse in your life? So oh, that's, straight that's off, crazy. you're like, yeah. It's like, it's, like the, it's like the prisoner of war thing. Yeah, it's totally leading questions. It's asking you, it's making you assume this event actually happened and then asking you to you fill in the blanks. There's, a, there's, a, there's another one here which says, um, is from another book on uh, repressed memories, the recovery from sexual abuse, which says, how old do you think you were when you were first abused? Write down the very first number that pops into your head, no matter how improbable it may seem. Does it seem too young to be true? I assure you it's not. And it's like, uh, it goes on to say, um, whoever is guiding, you know, the advice the author of this book gives is to say, whoever is guiding your memory will ask questions to help you picture or sense what is happening. If nothing surfaces, wait a bit and then give your best guess to the answer to the question. If you feel resistance or skepticism, try to go past it. Whatever, where, whether what you remember is made up or real is of no concern at the beginning of the process. Oh. So seeing I've gone down this rabbit hole now, I'm going to touch on it quickly. Um, there was an event uh, in the 1980s, one of these moral panic events. The in, satanic panic. Yeah, where people were really worried about children being sexually abused by satanists and the like. And one of the, the, the things that came up was... Um, a story of a daycare centre where children reported things happening that when they were questioned led to them believing they were being sexually abused. Now, the details of it just sound crazy off the top. So what they, they believe happened was the children were dropped off at the daycare centre. They were then taken via tunnels under the daycare centre to a local airport where they were put on aeroplanes and flown to Mexico where they were sexually abused by soldiers and then flown back and back through the tunnels and into the daycare centre before they were picked up by the parents. Now, no signs of tunnels, no signs of actual sexual abuse and stuff, and yet people went to jail for this. People wow. were convicted on the testimony of the children. Now, I have a... Where are we? I have a paper here, which I think was, I, I found while I was doing um, this. Which, uh, I'll find it later. Um, Ellen has held me off for looking for papers. I... <laughs> So um, they've actually found that with children's memories, especially all the way up to like an age of 10, the plausibility of the memory doesn't actually come into effect when children evaluate how likely it is to have happened. 
So if you if you ask leading questions, it doesn't matter that it didn't happen. You know, the children were falling uh, filling those examples. And it, um, an example in my personal life, which comes to mind, is when my niece was quite a bit younger. Um, she turned up one day to a, with her mum to see us, and um, I thought she'd had a haircut. So I asked her, you know, oh, when did, you, did you get your haircut? And she was like, yes, yeah, I got my hair. And she told me the story of her getting her hair cut. Her mum's standing there going, I have no idea what she's talking about. She hasn't had her hair cut since you last saw her. And she was literally, she trusted me. And she was feeling that thing. And she recalled it as a memory. It, it was, you know, it, it, she wasn't of an age where she was intentionally really making it up. She was, you know, she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, that, ha that happened. Oh, and no. Maybe in this case, she uh, forgot when she last saw you. I, I don't know how often you yeah. saw her, but maybe she thought that she she last had a haircut since, like, I don't know, maybe you last saw her a month ago and she'd actually had a haircut three weeks ago. Yes, uh, yeah, it's yeah, quite, uh, quite possible. So with all that, that stuff out of the way, we're going to talk about the Mandela effect. So, do you guys know what the Mandela effect is? Yes. Yes, I think so. So, oh, okay, now you're going to put me on the spot. Um, it takes its name from, I, I think, a, a, belief, a belief or like a rumor spreading around in like the 90s or even earlier that Nelson Mandela had died. And if you like ask people, like, is that Nelson Mandela by the way? They're like, yeah, yeah, he died, didn't he? Or so, and then they'd be like, no, no, he's 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 still alive. Yeah. And and that's that's the idea. Is like people, there's like this like weird like zeitgeist in the population that a commonly held fact is not the fact that people think it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a spawn. So it yes. it takes its name from uh, a lady called uh, Fiona Broom who, um, interesting enough, I think she was a parent, she calls herself a paranormal consultant. Um, and so basically she had a memory that, uh, well, a false memory in this case, that Nelson Mandela died in the 1980s and found that when she talked to other people, a lot of people held that memory as well. He actually um, died in 2013. So, you know, that's like three decades <laughs> off the mark. Um, but she looked had thought about this and came to the conclusion that the most likely explanation for why she would think he, he died is that that event actually occurred in an alternate reality and that she had now crossed over into a different reality where he didn't die in 1980 but died in 2013 and she just remembered the the truth and the reality she was in so this is the idea that the the Mandela effect sort of conspiracy theory come, comes into play. And it's where you, know, you have people who honestly think that the most likely explanation for these collective false memories are that these events happened the way you remember them, but you're not in that reality. And um, so to see if we are actually in the reality that we remember being in, I am going to do some little tests on you. Um, so I'm going to show you some pictures and get your A and B cards ready again. <laughs> again, if you're in the chat, um, say which one you think is right. Just type A or B. Um, so I'm going to show you some pictures and I want you to tell me which one you think is the right one. So here's the first one. So do you think A is the right one or B is the right one? Um... What's the difference? Oh, tunes. Um, yeah, it took me a long time to see it. Um, okay, so Ellen and Erica both say A, and Sam says B. Now, the correct answer is B. Um, I have already seen this one. No, no. Yep. Yes. Yep. So, how about um, this has nobody's responded in the chat? Uh, see if any they're on a 20 second delay oh they're, they're a bit yes yeah, so a bit delayed so we'll keep an eye on that so how about okay. how about this one? Oh, we have a b yeah oh. so someone else is with you sam okay so how about this one a or b which is the correct pikachu 
and Sam and Ellen both say A, and Erica says B. The answer is A. No. <laughs> yes. I spent all of grade eight math drawing Pikachu in my notebook. Well, uh, did you know that there was originally a third evolution of Pikachu in the original Gen 1 games that got not cut the because of cartridge space? Game. What? Of course it is. Pikachu's on the screen. <laughs> right. So, next one. Oh, didn't do so well in the chat on that one. Got, got that one wrong. So, uh, no, got it right. Oh, that one was right. That one was right. Dr. Osiris said A. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was right. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Which is the correct Febreze bottle? A or B? I am, I am really certain about this, but I've been really certain about all of them. They may have okay. changed their branding. Or they might be different in North America. Okay. You're all wrong. You're all said A. But it's Febreze, not Febreze. Then where did you get where did you get the picture from, Andrew, if it doesn't exist? <laughs> so Let's have a think about these. These are the, the three ones I want to go through for, for now. Let's have a think about this and think why people might have a false memory of these things. So let's go back to this one. I'm so disgusted. the people who got this one, uh, Erica, you, you got this one wrong, didn't you? And I think Ellen did as well. I got them all wrong. Do you want to, do you want to explain why you think it was A? Yes, because when I was a child, my favorite, there was like four, my favorite TV shows, TV show was Tiny Toon Adventures. And my, I remember my dad telling me when I was older that like Tiny Toons, Looney Tunes, people think that it's called after them, after tunes like the music, but it's actually about cartoons. And that's why it's called that. Yeah. So there's, 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 there's two things coming into play which we talked about in false memory. First of all, logical. Your memory can, wants your memory, your brain wants your memories to be logical. It being a loony cartoon is logical. It's much more logical than it being a loony tunes music when you know, they don't mm. always have songs in them. And, and also like the double O and the double O, like yeah, come on Warner Brothers, what, you, what were you thinking? Yeah, your brain <laughs> likes consistency. So straight off you've got uh something that a false memory that is more logical and more consistent than the truth so let's think about that when we come on to pikachu so why would you remember him having a little blackness on his tail because of his ears blackness. because of his ears oh yeah. he has he has blackness on the tips of his ears and so it is more consistent if he has blackness on the tip of his tail it it looks better, I would say, as well. It, it feels like that that is the right answer. So what about the Febreze? <laughs> it's breeze. It's pronounced Febreze. They have a window with breeze coming through it as their logo. You know, the whole marketing around it is fresh air coming in. So yeah. why would they spell it with one E? <laughs> I was desperately trying to find our Febreze bottle in the house, but I didn't, couldn't work out where it was. That's what I want to do. I'm like, I know I have a bottle somewhere. Yeah. Um, but it's, it seems ridiculous that they would spell it the incorrect way. So your brain does the logical and consistent thing of spelling yeah. it right. And so that's how you remember it. So I want to go through. So, so those are one reason why we might have um, sort of these false memories. Um, there are others. I'm going to go through a couple of uh, examples where there's pretty good evidence as to why these are generally misremembered. So get your A's and B's ready. I'm expecting you to do really well on this first one. So which is the correct saying, A or B? Yay, you all got it right. You all said it. But it's only because I've like heard this fact before. I was yeah, actually going right. to give this as an example of the Mandela fact when I was explaining. So this one is quite interesting because there's actually a, a fairly uh, a good reason why I think a lot of people get this wrong and why it's become in culture, um, Luke, I am your father, is what, what people think it is. So... Um, Oh, good. I wrote this down with the exact details and I've lost it in all my paperwork. So I'll 
Sure. Sort of made the year after um, Re- Return of the Jedi. Came, no, no, sorry, Empire Strikes Back. Goodness me, Empire Strikes Back came out. The, um, there was a comedy show on HBO. It was the I think the sixteenth Young Comedian of the Year awards. Now back then there wasn't that many TV channels as there are now, and so it was a show that got a large percentage of the viewing audience at that time. And one of the comedians on that show did a sketch. And in the sketch, he did this scene. And so Luke goes, you killed my father. And Darth Vader goes, Luke, I am your father. To which point Luke then turns around to Obi-Wan Kenobi and says, why did you tell me a lie? And Obi-Wan Kenobi responds with, Luke, I am your mother. And so that's very badly delivered is the joke. Um, but obviously it only works if one of them says, Luke, I am your father, and one says, Luke, I am your mother. So this is a, a show that was very popular. Large numbers of people watched it. Um, you also have various films over the years where they have said this quote and they've said the wrong quote. And so uh, the film Tommy Boy, which came out in the 1990s, has a scene where he's talking into a fan doing a Darth Vader voice and he does the Luke, I am your father quote. And so you have this thing happening in popular culture where the wrong quote is being put into people's heads. And, you know, and as we've already seen, misinformation can very easily replace factual information. So how about this one? Get your A's and B's ready. Which is the correct word? What in the film, Forrest Gump? I mean, I'm going to tell you what I would have said before coming on to a show about the Mandela effect. Yes. Okay. So we've got two A's and Sam says B. So Sam, do you, do you want to know, want to have a guess why you said B? Are you just it's... hedging your bets? <laughs> no, because um, uh, this, um, it got, repeated in my family incorrectly for ages because it, for some reason anytime anyone had a box of chocolate someone would quote this and then we were watching it one one day and realized it was wrong yeah so the most people think the quote is laugh is, is lack a box of chocolates that's my terrible forest jump okay, that was it, actually laugh was lack a box of chocolate Mama told me life was like a box of chocolates. Yeah. Like, so um, why, did, why do pe- most people remember it? Well, in this case, it's actually really easy to work out. As Ellen will tell you, one of my favourite things I like to do when I watch movie trailers and then we watch the film is go, that scene was different in the trailer. Mm. And this is an example of that. Oh. In the trailer for Forrey's Gump, he says life is like a box of chocolates. But in the movie, he says life was like a box of chocolates. So obviously people uh, uh, probably more people saw the the trailer than the movie and so again you get this this thing which isn't really a false memory but it is the one that sticks in people's heads but also to an extent surely they were primed for it if they saw the trailer and heard life is like box chocolates when they then heard life was they yeah. hear it as is it's easy trailer. to align those sounds yeah yeah Can that so, also be something to do with um what they think is kind of almost grammatically correct like um you know mama always said like this like a box of chocolates only makes sense if the mother's dead but if you but if you don't remember that the mother's died at that point i guess then you would think it's life is Hmm. rather than life was i can't remember the film that well i can't remember if the mother was dead sounds like life in the past and yeah yeah so those are my things i want to talk about the mandela effect so we have some very common examples of uh, so i just wanted breaking news um one of my friends just texted me a bottle of febreze like a photo (laughs) awesome uh, from from her house and it's the the one yeah it's only one e yep so what, what, what do you guys think? Is it the, the, the false memory thing going on here? The, you know, the, the logical, consistent things, the way we're playing on, you know, pop culture information overriding what we actually think happened? Or are we in parallel dimensions? 
I'm going to go with Occam's razor on this one. Yeah, the parallel dimensions. Agreed. <laughs> Get out. So we, there, there's a lot of research which also sort of goes into looking at sort of collective false memories. And um, we, the, there's a general idea that um, remembering is something of a social experience. You know, we've already um, looked at how other people can alter our memories, how we change them ourselves and stuff like that. But think about uh, in your own personal life, when you're talking to friends about an event you've, you've gone to, or it's not just one person monologuing. You all talk, you all remember things, and, you know, and some people might remember it a little differently because they're at different vantage points and stuff like that, or you know, they took different things from the situation, and so they focus on those. And you take that information in and your memory changes as a result of this. So other people affect your memories. And this, we, we've already talked about how being exposed to the false information can override normal information. Um, and uh, in line with the talking to people, false memories uh, come in through everyday interaction. We all get things wrong every day. It's kind of like the telephone game. You know, you, you hear something, you pass it on to somebody, they pass it on, then they tell you what they heard and you roll to your memory and it all gets all mixed up. Um, so they've done various experiments on this and they did, um, so word list experiments are a good one where they'll give people a list of words and they, they sort of prime them. Um, so they'll use words that imply other words. So um, baking, wheat, flour, uh, toast, things like that. And people remember the word bread um, because the word the bread, bread wasn't mentioned in the list. And so what they would do is they would get people to do these tests individually. And then they would either get them to recall them individually or as part of a group. So in the group setting, they would do it two different ways. So they would get either get people to just say, okay, take it in turns to recall the word. And so they'd go around the group and see who could recall the most words. Or they would get the group as a whole to just, you know, to say, oh, this is what I think it said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they found that in general, groups remember less well than individuals. It's some, I think they, they said it's something to do with kind of the, um, you don't try as hard. <laughs> if you think other people are going to do the remembering yeah. for you, you don't try as hard. Is it, it, is it also <laughs> like, that like social influence thing that, that Chris was talking about that like um with that experiment with, with seeing that light in the distance yeah. that like we'll just like assume that other that like collectively other people have it right and that we're wrong yeah but um, is it when you say they remembered less well is it that they that they didn't get as sorry, many of the things me, that they could me, remember me. or that they misremembered more things like so um both Okay. So um, it depends on, so if you did the group where people were chatting between each other, there was a sort of basic built-in error correction. So I would say, oh, I remember bread, and someone else would say, well, I don't think that was on the list. Mm. Um, and so you'd have the error correction built in. So they, the groups, both types of groups remember fewer words than individuals. But the group where there was error correction would remember less false words. But the group where they each had to present a word would remember more false words that weren't actually in it. Now, interestingly enough, is when they tested people individually afterwards, they found that the false memories held over. So people individually tested would now remember the false words that weren't there beforehand. Um, so these are all good, you know, there's a lot of research out there on how collectively we get false memories. And, and, and of course, you bring in the internet where people make memes and stuff. And, you know, someone creates a popular meme which misquotes a movie. That's the thing people are going to remember more than the movie. Um, and so, yeah, um, that is pretty much where I'm going to end it. Um, I, I think um, we're pretty safe from the idea that we're actually in parallel universes. Though Ellen does think the trees down near the park near us did magically appear so it's possible we have shifted uh into a parallel universe um i do want to say one one thing um actually before i shut up is much like when we were talking about flat earthers and there is a slightly negative side of this you know 
with the flat earthers there there was the the thing where people would often lose social connections and stuff um with a lot of people who really strongly believe in the mandela effect there is a, a fair amount of people even be the so picture it this way okay you suddenly encounter something that makes you believe you're no longer in the same reality that you were in before suddenly your family is not your family your friends are not your friends mm -hmm. they are different versions of them and there's some quite upsetting videos out there of some of the big proponents who promote the mandela effect and there's a couple of videos where people sort of have more candid moments where they're generally broken by this because they they feel they've lost their family their family's still there but they mm -hmm. feel that then they've lost them they've lost their real family and so while this is all a bit of we've had a bit of fun looking at things like that people who take these things seriously people who don't understand how fallible our memories are how easily they are distorted can come to conclusions that generally cause them upset in their lives um so yeah that's i, I want to say that I, if you guys have any questions if any questions in the chat i'm happy to try and answer them as usual i've gone way over time because i can't shut up but it was super Sorry. interesting have you got to play games? If you were going to show us more pictures of cats, I, I had a sign for Fredo's. It's just a cat. That's the I, I, I still have my. Uh, maybe. No. Maybe no aliens. Yes, I don't have my aliens. Well, that was crazy. Oh, that was, it, that was it, crazy. Actually, that's interesting. You know, a, a particular um, Mandela effect thing I came across while researching this is that some people out there believe that uh, we used to have someone called Chris on the show. And that it's not always been Ellen since the beginning. So, you know, if that's, if you're one of those people, you know, maybe you should Chris question how good your next memory week. is. So. Stay, stay tuned for next time then if you, if you believe that. Yeah. Well, we can, we can segue into, you know, what it is that we're doing next time, which is that we're not sure as far as I know. Yes. No, it, no we're not. No. So in, in the meantime, if anyone wants to give us a suggestion for a topic you'd like us to cover, that would be awesome. I've got some ideas on my sleeves, but I'm not going to commit to them right in this moment. Um, we're hoping Chris comes back. Not that there was Chris anybody called back. Chris, of course, but we're hoping he comes back with lots of ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He can he can tell us about what he's been up to uh, in his in his absence. But yeah, for now, I think all that needs to be done is say thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you next thanks time. Thank you. thank you for joining us, Ellen. It's you've been a great guest star. And we'll see you guys in two weeks. Topic TBD, but we will announce it.